So this is a two-week series on the cross. And as I was thinking about this, and um, uh, there's so much one can say about the cross. But it seemed that uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the cross and the Jesus movement, or the way, whatever we want to talk about Christianity, uh, in urban context. We live in an urban context. Um, and also, uh, since so much of what we hear is not an urban context, in, in the Gospels in particular. So, uh, we're going to, the trajectory of this presentation is going to take us from uh, the villages of Palestine to the cities of um, the Roman Empire. And you all will, will participate, highly participatory. Here we go. <laughs> So, I have to see how this works. There we go. So, uh, the first gospel to be written uh, that we have in the New Testament is, for, for those of you who have uh, gone to Pastor Durr's regular Bible studies, is the gospel according to St. Mark. Right. Uh, and this is how Mark begins his gospel at the beginning. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see I am sending my messenger ahead of you, dot, dot, dot. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming the baptism of repentance and forgiveness, and people from the whole Judean countryside, and all the people of Jerusalem went where? Out. Out to the wilderness. So here you have the first gospel, writing of Jesus, probably reflective in a sense of what happened, but notice that they're not flocking to Jerusalem. It's the people, the whole people of the countryside are going out of their way to go out to the middle of nowhere, to the wilderness. Uh, not only that, the gospel writer makes a big deal about the people in the city of Jerusalem going out. And not even to see Jesus at this point, but to see John the Baptist. So here, here you have uh, the beginning of the Gospels, at least, um, which those of you who have gone to these studies know that there are various sources, one of them being a very early source, we call that Q, because for source. Uh, this material is drawn, we know the, the John the Baptist material is drawn from that source. Why? Because it appears in all the other Gospels. And uh, all the other gospel writers have to deal with this problem, which is, who is more popular, John or Jesus? Mark didn't quite deal with that very well. He just put it down on paper. So let's just keep examining the beginning of this story. Remember to push the arrow down. Then, the next thing you have is this Jesus of Nazareth, uh, of Galilee. So, Nazareth is a small little village. Some of you have probably been there small little village in uh, Galilee, he goes to see John in the wilderness. So Jesus' first trip, first public trip, is not to Jerusalem, but to the wilderness. There's a uh, huge focus uh, in, the, in the Gospels uh, on anything but the city. And we'll get to what what does the what do the gospels have to say about the city? Let, let's get one one more thing. So we've got John out in the wilderness and the people coming to him. Jesus going to John, and then here as we continue in this narrative in Mark's gospel, you have now Jesus is traveling about the countryside, and now wherever he goes into the villages or the cities, or the farms. It's very interesting, even though this word is here, Jesus has not yet shown, narratively, if you read Mark's Gospel, Jesus has not shown up in the city. So this is a very curious thing in the text. All the emphasis being on people going farms. from the villages and from farms. The farms. And in the marketplaces, it's the, you know, for those of you who traveled around the Palestinian countryside, um, depending on when you went, you could see this. The people would bring in 
their produce into the towns and villages, the farm stands along the way. Uh, so now all of these people are bringing uh, they're sick and they're, they're ill, and the people with problems, they're coming to see Jesus. This is a, if you track through Mark's gospel, this is the transfer from John to Jesus in terms of importance. But where is Jesus? He's in the countryside. He hasn't gone to the city. And let's, and so to push this a little further, think about the language now of scripture. What are some of the passages? I pulled a couple out that come to mind. Here's, here's probably one of the, uh, most people start to think of parables. This is one that probably comes to mind immediately. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, nowhere close to the city. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the crowd stood on the beach, not the city. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and eat them up. What is this the language of? Sower and seeds. This is a this is agrarian culture. You think about so many of the different parables. It wasn't that Jesus went to the you know the pub around the corner and had a a, a beer, but uh, this is the la the language of the parables that is the that comes from the earliest Jesus tradition. All languages of the countryside, of villages, um, of. Uh, large waterways. And uh, it's interesting, too, as you continue to read through this um, parable, look at how, look at how the, the imagery kind of piles on. You, you start off with uh, this, this, the sowing and seeds that fall on a path. And now they are uh, the sun rose, important to the all of us, but especially important in agrarian uh, culture. Um, they took root, they withered, they were among the thorns, uh, there was good soil. So the, it's not only just a passing reference to something uh, uh, on the country, in the countryside, but just piles and piles and piles of this imagery. Look at another one. This is, this is obviously the parable, what we know as the parable of the prodigal son from Luke, only appears in Luke's gospel. Think about the setting. What is the setting of this parable? Where, where are they? The man had two sons, and he divided up his land. What type of land was it? I mean, we get the senses, we read. They go out and they, at the end of the story, they go out and butcher the fatted calf, right? Isn't you think that someone, no one was, it's not, you know, raising these uh, cattle in the middle of Jerusalem. They're out on the farm. But if you think about this, so here you've got the, uh, he's even, I find this to be really fascinating when you think about this. So here he is, he says, Father, let's divide up this property. So he does it. And a few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country which sounds, is intended to sound uh, exotic. And you think about the mindset of someone uh, on a farm. They, so a person going to some, on some sort of long journey, leaving the farm, that's probably unheard of. It's very rare. But now this, the author has you know, made this sound even more exotic. They've gone off to now some distant country. There might be a city there. Uh, and what did he do? But there he squandered his property and desolate living. Uh, so he spent all his money. He sort of, you know, and I, I suppose that if the Metropolitan Opera were recasting the story of the prodigal son, maybe they would set this in, La in Las Vegas or something like that. Oh, that's Rigoletto. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, and, but what images, so the, the younger son is off in this foreign country. And what images come to mind? What does he remember? Right I'm there sorry. The what is he the, remember? So this younger son is off, squandering away all of his father's money in some distant land, also known as Las Vegas. <laughs> and what images come to his mind as he's? His father's farm. The farm. 
He's, even, he's thinking about the pigs on the field. Um, and, and as we, we go on, of course, he returns. But this is interesting. What does the, what is the father's, so it's, the parable hinges on uh, the father and the other, the older son's view of what the younger son had been doing. He went off to some distant country. He wasn't here on the farm. He wasn't helping out. And what do they, what, what do they even say of, of him? For the son of mine was dead. He was alive again. He was lost and was found. And he began to celebrate. Well, Luke, of course, is using this in a variety of theological ways. But it's very, very base from a, from a text perspective, a narrative perspective. The author has taken this whole idea of going off to some other distant country, to some, probably some urban area, not the farm. And uh, that was the end of this guy's life. He that's came sort back. of a bias against the city. Exactly. That's that's. So, I mean, I'm going to read a, a, a piece of this in, in, a, in a second. But if you think about the language of the Gospels, uh, the the there, there is all of this saturation of language of farms and villages and small little 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 park countryside, um, and anything outside of that view is really suspicious. In fact, uh, well, I want to do the Jesus march to, to, to Jerusalem, but let's just look at this one more time. I think this is fascinating. Uh, so we're back in Mark's Gospel. So not only have, the, have, have people from the countryside and the villages gone out to see Jesus and uh, wandering about the countryside, but here, the, the Pharisees and some of the scribes from Jerusalem go out. So, the, so um, not only is, is uh, scripture dense with all of this, but even the city folk are going out. Even uh, the Jesus kind of religious um, opponents might be a little too strong in every one of these cases, but the people that he has conflict with. Critics. 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 There you go. So now, uh, but now let's think about when does, when does the, we start to see, obviously Jerusalem works its way into the text mm -hmm. with the mention of Jerusalem and the John the Baptist piece. And here, uh, and we kind of stand exactly where Jesus stood when I, we go to this next slide and we go to this part of Mark. And that is after the transfiguration. Jesus is up on the mountain. And when he comes down, the path that he takes, we're going to trace it, goes to one place, Jerusalem. So it's in, it's uh, interesting when you look at the whole of Mark's gospel and the other gospels follow this. Um, the transfiguration moment is Jesus' turn toward Jerusalem. And look what he does. He goes, uh, they went out there and passed through Galilee. He didn't want anybody to know. He's on his way. He's, now he starts to make it explicit. Um, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands. So just imagine this. You're, if, you, if you are a person who's living in the countryside of Jerusalem and you're hearing this, oh my goodness, Jesus, God, is going to Jerusalem. You know that he's been crucified. So just uh, this is like a writer's, you can see what's going on with the writer here. So now he's, he's gone to the village of Galilee. Go a little further. Now he's come to Capernaum. It's like he's doing the, a cycle through the, the country. And then um, uh, he, he hears them arguing. There's this dissension. He's on his way to Jerusalem. There's something is wrong, going wrong with these disciples, with the, with, the, with, the, with the people that are following him. He left that place and went to the region of Judea. So now he's getting uh, even beyond the Jordan. He's getting even closer to Jerusalem. And the crowds gathered around him, and he taught them. And then uh, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And many of you have probably gone on this, this road from the, uh, you're on your way, you're going to pass by Jericho, a small little village town, uh, just north of the Dead Sea. You're on your way to Jerusalem. It's getting more 
more and more anxious, more and more concerned. And here they are, they're approaching uh, Jerusalem. They're right outside, Bethany is right outside of, of Jerusalem. It's closer to Jerusalem than uh, Bethlehem is to Jerusalem. Uh, they're near the Mount of Olives. Uh, go into yet another village. How many villages can we go into before uh, we decide to go into Jerusalem? Here we are. He entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. He had a look about and he left. Uh, following day he comes back and this, he curses the fig, uh, fig tree. And then what does he do? What's Jesus' first sort of real action in Jerusalem? In Jerusalem? So this is temple visit number one. He goes, what is, what's missing right here? You know the answer to this. Tables, money changers. Oh, no, right. not there. So when he goes in, uh, here he is. Uh, and what does Jesus uh, do but upsets all of the, the, which is the economy of the city. And think about those people. Think about those money changers. If they showed up on your family farm, uh, do you think they would have been treated with any sort of hospitality? No. No. They were, they were suspicious. Um, they worked for the... They were, they were, they were uh, <laughs> subcontracted yeah. by the Roman Empire to take advantage of you. Um, so here, you, this, is, this is... We're just basically looking through Mark. But if Mark does this, you get... Because Matthew and uh, Luke have Mark, you start to see... Um, how this, the early Jesus uh, tradition, everything that's coming out of probably Jesus' very lifespan, is centered uh, in the countryside with this, we know this sort of trek to, to Jerusalem, and there is a great deal of trepidation, even death, death on a cross. Probably not the place uh, anyone from a village would want to go. This is a uh, I uh, wish it could be larger, but this is just the, simply the map of, of that whole countryside. You could trace Jesus' securitous route here, uh, finally to the city of Jerusalem. Um, so I want to read to you the, the uh, probably one of the most uh, important studies, not because anyone did it, hadn't done this before him, came from Wayne Meeks, now retired, um, called First Urban Christians, uh, the social uh, world of the New Testament. And what makes this particular volume amazing is not only his own scholarship, but that it is also a, um, uh, brings all of the scholarship that had been done prior to him into one volume. It kind of makes sense of it. And I wanted to read um, just a paragraph. It's a long paragraph, but it's an important paragraph from uh, uh, First Urban Christians, which quotes um, probably the definitive study on the Roman, uh, uh, the social landscape of the Roman Empire, done by um, uh, Wayne Meeks's colleague uh, Ramsey McCollum. As the cities grew, so. Uh, this is a little bit out of order because I know we haven't talked about uh, Rome, but you, we all know our uh, Greco-Roman history uh, and how important those cities, we'll get to that next, so just bear with me here. As the cities, that is the cities of the Roman Empire, grew in number and power, their relations with the countryside became more and more ambivalent. Each depended upon the other, but by every measure of physical and social advantage, the symbiosis was one-sided in favor of the city. Under uh, the uh, Principate, agriculture continued to be the base of the whole empire's economy, but ownership of productive land was increasingly concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer proprietors who lived in the city or its extension, their villas. The small independent landowners living on their own land began to disappear. Reduced to tenancy or slavery, gone to the city to subsist as laborers, or recruited into the army. 
for thousands of tiny fragments of, from thousands of tiny fragments of evidence, Ramsey McCollin has described the way people experienced the results. Here is the money of, the, of this paragraph. Economic ties between urban and rural centers are thus of the closest. They are not friendly. The two worlds regard each other as, on one side, clumsy, brutish, arrogant, uncivilized. On the other side, as baffling, extraordinate, and arrogant. Peasants who move to a town feel overwhelmed by its manners and dangers and seek out relatives or previous immigrants from the same village to settle among. Rent or tax collectors who come out to the country face a hostile reception and can expect attempts to cheat and resist them even by force. They respond with their own brutality. The cities were, were where power was. They were also the places where changes could occur. But Cullen emphasizes the conservatism of villages their central characteristic. They and their population hovered so barely above subsistence level that no one dared risk a change. If some extraordinary circumstance should compel a villager to seek change, the lucky inheritance of religious vision or even rarely the accumulation of a little real money through frugality, shrewdness, and hard work, it must be in the city that this person would work out their new life. So again, that's uh, from both Meeks and McCullen's uh, extensive studies of how people moved about the social uh, and economic landscape of, uh, of the time. So it begs the question, would Christianity have had any chance if it had simply remained in the villages. If it hadn't gone, as we know it has gone, to the city and to the urban environments, what would have, what would have happened? Do you know, we think that those little uh, countrysides that were uh, deeply uh, Jewish in, in nature, would they have allowed someone to have really ultimately followed this Jesus and changed over to uh, and this, no, this, this, this huge shift, um, we're not going to get into it, but this whole huge shift and uprising and um, religious movement uh, happened really in the city context. Um, but the message of Jesus to the, uh, the landless and the poor was attractive. Exactly. Yep. But it wasn't, and his message wasn't really attractive in the city. Well, well, according to this to this reading, but where we're going, where we'll go next, and hold that, what, you know, uh, that thought. What about these villagers? What about uh, not non-city people? What about those people that might have saved up enough, or they got fed up with someone? They were like the prodigal son, and they actually went to the city because their uh, evangelist was Saint Paul, right? So that's where we're headed next. So here's uh, kind of a view of the Roman uh, Empire, um, the early part of the century here is the largest expanse. Um, what we know happened, right, is that uh, from uh, center, all of these various conquests, and we're in this area over here in the Middle East, um, the Romans set, they did a, did a variety, over the span of this history, had a variety of approaches, but in the, in the biblical times, we know that they sort of set up these, what I call puppet kings. Jared, I'm sorry, I can't read, what are the colors? I can't read. This is just the expanse of the empire. So this is 211 BC, e, and as it grows, 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 and grows in the timeline, uh, this is the sort of section of the so we're over here in the Middle East, and what they did is they sort of, they set up, they went to these areas, and they set up camp, and they got a local ruler to take 
to, to take charge and be in sort of cahoots with them. Uh, but they also, uh, what arose were all of these city-states, little polices, uh, all over the Mediterranean, and the Romans connected them, right, by roads. Well, that was a, that was a big deal. Yeah. So uh, this uh, is the is the kind of critical is the critical thing for the Christian movement. This is a little small. I'll try to read it. This is the this is Paul's missionary activity. Uh, for so, for example, so his conversion, and of course, his trip, his first missionary journey, the trip to Antioch. Uh, you can, these are very very small, but you can remember that journey. He comes back. So he, he's gone out first on the Roman roads and started to spread his message. He's founded the church in Thessalonica, the, the earliest. Um, he's founded the church of Galatia and the Thess Thessalonians of Corinth will come later. But already he's starting to work with non-Jews. He's working with the Gentiles, right? So he gets called back to Jerusalem. Uh, and the question is, what you're doing legitimate? They have an agreement. Uh, he breaks it. <laughs> He's good at that. Um, then he goes out for his second missionary journey, uh, even further. And then the third missionary journey, it's interesting, his final one is said to have been to go even to Rome itself, where he was imprisoned and eventually which is interesting. If you think about Paul's, the trajectory, not the details, but the sort of trajectory of Paul's life, what does it look like? So did we just talk about Jesus? So if you if you read through all of the Pauline, authentic Pauline literature, and even those pretending to be Paul, what's the greatest anxiety? He's worried about going to Rome and being killed. So Jesus, village to Jerusalem was a big deal. Now you have Paul and all of his work in the outlying parts of the Roman Empire, and the big scary thing was Rome. So if you just trace that, uh, there were a number of roads that the Romans built that were very important. And if you trace them, so here down here is Jerusalem. So this is the common route, uh, which went from Antioch, all the way over to Ephesus. And so Paul, think of all of these places that Paul, including Tarsus, where he said he's from, um, those, he wouldn't have been able to travel this without the Roman Empire. Or um, uh, the other road, other major road, which went from uh, Byzantium all the way over to this coast. There's Thessalonica, and there's Philippi. So let's think about Paul now for a little bit. Um, it's very interesting in his, uh, this is from 2 Corinthians. He talks about all of the dangers that he faced. Dangerous from rivers, dangerous from bandits, dangerous from my own people, dangerous from gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters. One significant thing is missing. So does he not talk about that at all? That land that gets worked and is productive, not just the wilderness, you're not going to farm, right? He, he's not even, this man is not even thinking about uh, those farms and villages that Jesus was ministering to. His is a whole different world. And let's just think a little bit about uh, Paul's background. Uh, he is, he, every chance he gets in all of his correspondence, says, I supported myself. He was a great supporter, even though he relied on a lot of people. He was very proud of the fact that he was a tent maker. When uh, Lucinda Mosier was here a couple of weeks ago, she did this presentation about um, uh, Aquila and Priscilla and um, Lydia. Well, here they are. So they were of the same trade. They were tent makers. 
Paul, <coughs> Paul's occupation wasn't tied to the ground. He, he wasn't one of those people who needed to go out and sow seed to make money. Uh, nor was he you know, a banker or a lawyer or whatever in the city. He was someone who could take his craft, the making of tents, uh, on the road. And literally, he did. In fact, that's where he meets some of, you know, two of his closest uh, friends. Maybe they had so much, they were common because they were tent makers. He could go anywhere and make money. Everybody knew the tent. I think, too, of Lydia, uh, the dealer of purple cloth. She could go anywhere. Right? And if you think about, I mean, even our own time, think about urban centers. What rises up in urban centers that does not rise up on the farm? Ballet, right? Uh, all of these different, uh, this is, so farms are where food is produced. The urban centers is where all of the other uh, uh, sort of cultural things happen, all the, all the pieces that you need to support uh, culture on a larger scale. Paul, that was critical to Paul's ministry. It was also then critical to the spread of the gospel. Um, so let's talk. I want to talk a little bit about one this this community, the Corinthian community, um, and before we read this, a word about this correspondence. Paul had founded the church in Corinth and then had gone on that road to another place. And in the meantime, uh, another preacher, Apollos, came in. And he uh, started to, to uh, mess around with that community. And factions started to, to, to arise in the, in the community. So some people in the community wrote to Paul to tell him this was going on. And so he wrote a fiery response. And we call that fiery response. 1 Corinthians. So uh, you have to remember that he's, he's, he's really aggravated. He's spent all of his time there. He's gone on to somewhere else, probably on foot. Um, and now he gets word that this community that he's poured so much energy into is, and he was so proud of, um, had some, some problems. So here he is. This is the beginning of, of the letter, which is a fascinating way to, to, to greet someone. Uh, he said, God, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're shall we begin reading? But God chose what is foolish in the world to ch shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. Here is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let no one boast both in the Lord, and Paul goes on to boast himself. Yes. But uh, the point is here, he is addressing one of the, his urban church, his urban community, which has all of these different sorts of people in it. They started to have factions. They started to rise up and say, well, I know what I'm talking about. I'm listening to Apollos, and uh, you must be dumb because you're, you're you keep following the way of Paul. So Paul writes, it's facetious, and it's filled with all sorts of, uh, uh, you have to kind of read large uh, sections of Corinthians to see uh, really what Paul's point is, because it's so integrated into his rhetoric. He, he's basically taking the people that have decided that they're above everybody else and said, uh-uh, all the way down here. And then he's, the. The people that they have decided are at the very bottom of the total pool. He's basically done this. Um, and that's how he begins this letter to the church in Corinth, which is a clue that here's this community, this urban community, that is, that's a pretty good sign of diversity, probably diversity of uh, economic background, uh, their own sort of intellect, their training, etc. And as we keep reading the letter, we can uncover that this community was pretty diverse. Unlike, think about the farm country, the farm country, right? When Jesus goes, nobody argues. No one on those farms argues with Jesus. Never. It's the demons that come out, or the scribes and the Pharisees, etc. 
So Paul's world is much different. It's actually closer to the world we live in. I was just thinking also yes. as we fast forward to the 21st century, well, when you were talking about the uh, parable of the prodigal son, I kept thinking, well, why not go to the city? He wanted to spread his wings, he exactly. wanted to investigate new and different things. So think, think, think about that, you know, if you're a person living on a mom and dad's farm, and you're, you're going to go to the, what does that mean for the farm? You know, they're not there to take care of it. I mean, Fam, just family farms, they just die away. Which means, the whole, in a sense, the whole family dies. That's really what's going on in the prodigal son. He said, split it up. Which basically, everybody's dead in that story. But you may as well throw in the towel. In, in, in slightly too simplistic in looking at the message of Jesus. Because if, if we are, in, in the 21st century, if we are going to ask younger people to become involved in that message, if we paint the cities as being bad places and, and because I know I went through a period mm. during that whole time, I didn't go to church yeah. because I was too busy, you know, trying to get up there in the world, mm -hmm. so to speak. So I, just, I guess I was just noodling about the message of Jesus yeah. is relevant. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good question. And looking at these early communities maybe might give us a clue because we're not all that much different. Society is really changed. Um, the big crisis for the Corinthian community. Uh, there are many of them. The big one, I think, is uh, when it gathers together for the community meal. Uh, and it's a little long, but I think I'll just point out a few things here. So here's this diverse community in the city of Corinth uh, that has come together regularly to share a meal. Uh, these are the, this is, uh, this is the agape love feasts that Paul would share. So he says, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. That's not to say that this community wasn't sharing the Lord's Supper. He's talking about this practice. Their way of keeping the Lord's Supper, not its mechanisms, but the, the way they relate to one another is not how you were not intended is not what is intended by the Lord's Supper. And he goes on, he explains what he means. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. Well, how could that possibly be? Well, because the lower end gets to eat last. Yeah, why? Because they come late. late. And in fact, he'll go on, he'll say in his corrective, he says, wait for one another. Why? Because the, the, the people who had the the lower paying jobs, probably, they couldn't just leave. They weren't their own bosses. They they weren't like Lydia who, who could, she could decide when she was going to dunk that die and when she was not going to. Um, and then think about a city. You know, people coming from further reaches to the, the, the point of center. But these churches weren't in the center. They were on the outskirts, which meant, so if you were living on the other end of town, you had to cross into the center of town and then out to the other side. So that's why people arrived at different times, and they didn't wait for one another. The people who had it better off just went right ahead. And Paul has a problem with that, because he says, well, don't you have your own wine at home? You know, why, why do you have to get drunk here? Um, so then he goes on, for I received from the Lord what was handed on to me. And this you have the, the quotation of the uh, words of institution. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul is saying that what you are doing is proclaimed by the sharing this meal is to do the very central act of the Christian faith, which is to remember Christ. And he says, you're not doing it. But this is how you can do it. Um, so then, my sisters and brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. And if you're hungry, eat a little bit at home before you come, which is to say, you have a lot of time on your hands. So eat, eat a little bit before you come. And then when you are together, it will, you will not be eating and drinking to your own time. You will actually embody, you will be that thing which you say you are, which is the body of Christ, this thing you share. Um, so, it's not explicit, but if you re read between these lines, what you see is this, the urban context 
brings together uh, all different sorts of people into this community, into the body of Christ. Um, and if you, when you read these uh, letters, what you see is Paul dealing with the incredible diversity that's in each of those communities. Uh, so this is part one of a two-part series. Next week, we'll look at some of those uh, things. So you can imagine what they are. Uh, because you have the, the interdynamics of the community, and you have that community's relationship to the wider city. Um, so what does uh, Paul and these, these churches have to say about leadership in the community, about how the community is financed? What do you do with people who, you know, might have been the oddballs in the, out on the farms or in the villages who have moved to the cities and are now part of this community? What do you do with conflict in the church? Um, when you, we'll, we'll look at a number of these things next week and as a, a way of preview, what you'll see is that um, all that other writing in the New Testament is really not aimed at the, the countryside that Jesus was walking about, but it is the language of the city. Uh, so, um, and, it, and it's interesting because if you think about before the Revised Common Lectionary, you would never have read that in church, right? You had uh, your a lot of those those writings were just not not read. But here, that we have a reading from so-called epistles every, uh, just about every Sunday, except for when they come from a slightly different part of scripture. Uh, so we hear every Sunday in our lectionary that kind of, uh, all of what Christianity has been, which is the countryside and the city and the relationship of the two, which is what we still live with, and people who, uh, migrate to cities um, and craft or, as we say, creatively shape life in the city. Um, it's a different, it's got a different accent. Um, so as you, read, as you read your Bibles and hear these scriptures, I hope that your ears will tune into some of this and think that, wow, without Rome, without these streets, without the uh, the upward mobility that became somewhat possible and then created a great deal of complication in Rome, uh, we wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, Christianity really uh, took off and uh, because of uh, the complications, the incredibly complex uh, narrative it is its relationship to the Roman Empire. Questions, comments? No, I'm glad you said complexity because uh, I was just thinking of my comment about the, the parable of the prodigal son. Christianity is more complex than city bad, country good. I mean, the, exactly. the message of Christ can fit. There's a really, and there's a relation. There's a, as you said, symbiotic relationship between city and, and we feel that even today. Where would we get our food in New York City if we didn't have Whole Foods? Because <laughs> they grow it right. <laughs> French direct, yeah, it comes in a box. <laughs> and it's and it's um, and even this, this whole business of church, which has been so reduced to kind of following moral. That's that's actually not when you start to to dig uh, into these script, the scripture texts. It's far broader than. Uh, you know, controlling someone's moral behavior. It's how we relate to one another. Um, and it's not easy. It's complex, and there are multiple answers based yeah, on your context. You could say without Rome, maybe Christianity wouldn't have spread. Well, Paul himself makes <coughs> claim to be a Roman citizen. It's important to him. You champion that. Jesus wouldn't. <laughs> and because of the nature of St. Peter's, it's, it's a city. It's a exactly. country itself. Yep. With all of those parents. Yep. And it's interesting, you have the, the book club this week, or the last week or the week before, read that book about uh, how, Amer how cities are, I think the title said, Saving America. 
who was anyone there? Uh, but that's a whole study on what is going on in urban contexts now that uh, will, in this author's view, save the United States. And my grandmother wouldn't, wouldn't know what to say about that. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you all. Thank See you. Thank you.